everyone in COT and on the networks. It is good to be here. Folks, you wouldn't believe what happened today. You just wouldn't believe it. You would have to be here to believe it yourself. It was unimaginable. And a great many people in Council of Times uh, chat room and chat room can attest to that. Something different has happened today. A move, a real move. A real move of the Father's love in the chat room. And some people were, did give their lives over to Christ unlike any other way I've seen it before. In fact, it was, I haven't seen anyone give their lives to Christ like this because they were not. Anyway, in the chat room, we were in such a state of praise Things began to happen. They did. They really started happening. Hearts were opened up. It was a miracle within itself. Yet something we're going to experience more and more of. And you know what? As we did that, did you guys understand that the concepts we have in the Bible, although some of them are different, how much they no longer mattered? When God's presence entered into us, did you notice how everything fell off? Everything fell off. Differences did not matter. Your situation started to fade away. Things just did not matter. And a true confidence raised. You know what happened? The new creature that resides within each of us, it, it started to stand up. It is standing within a great many of us. Yokes were broken through praise, which ushered that in. Folks, we are in the book of Revelation. I have to warn you, though, I have very little composure. See, I feel kind of guilty because most people have things to do in their homes, and that was all disrupted today during our chat. And you know, we had a chat session. That no one was talking. Pastor Scott was playing praise music. He would read the scripture every so often, but something different was happening there. So there's no way I can explain it. I, there's, I just can't explain it to you. You'll have to sneak in there one time. We didn't time this either. It wasn't timed. It wasn't scheduled. It just took place. It's just something that happened. And wow, did it happen. Can you guys hear me okay? Is the volume okay? Maybe up just a little bit more. I don't like to uh, speak too loud. We most certainly have to do that again. That was wonderful. Okay, you guys, have, yes, yes, tribe, it was authentic, very authentic. And you know what? As we're in the book of Revelation, that authenticity of the spirit is, become a, is, is going to become a prize goal to obtain. And you know what? It's, it's so easy to obtain. But it comes in like a flood when two or three are gathered together. In the name of our Lord, it comes in like a flood. But you know, folks, things are happening in the world, and I certainly wasn't thinking about anything happening in the world. Uh, and it's really hard to get back into uh, this composure. And I still can't explain to you guys how in the world well, there's no logical explanation why I typed when I typed. It just kind of popped out there. It just start raising up. It began to raise up. And when the spirit starts flowing, I won't hold back. You know, there are many times when I'm in front of other people because it's, I look for the Lord's results in the world all the time. And there are many, many times I cannot wait to get back to my secret place to pray. Mostly I give him praise. I end up speaking about what he has done, what I have witnessed of his hand in the world. So it ends up as praise. I guess you really couldn't call it prayer. It's more praise than prayer. Prayer is a petition. And I do petition on the behalf of others a lot. But sometimes I can't wait to get back to my secret place so I can really get on my knees and bow before Jesus Christ. And you know what? There's something about, there's a difference. Listen, 
There's a difference. If you don't believe it, try it yourself. There's a difference between saying, thank you, Lord, not kneeling, not bowing or anything, and bowing in full and saying, thank you, Lord. There's a difference. There's a huge difference. Number one, your posture bears witness to what's inside you. It's a full surrender when you do that. And I have taken a knee in public, and nobody knew why. There are often times I cannot help myself. I have to take a knee. And when I take a knee, that's my recognition of him despite who's watching. I've done it in all manner of places. I've done it in places I'm not supposed to do it in, but I did it anyway. I've taken a knee. Even in places where they said, you can't uh, mention the name of Christ, I've taken a knee in them. I did it anyway. They had no idea what I was doing, what I was doing it for, but I did it. I wasn't looking for them to notice. I was compelled to do it, so I did it. That's just my character. If I get compelled to do something, it's going to come out one way or the other. But see, that's a strength we're going to need to continue. As you guys know, and you look at the conditions of the world, there are a great many things facing the world. Shame on them. But we need to clear up some facts tonight. We're going to clear up some facts. Because a great, you know, with the ones who were with us today, I know that humility is with them right now. Their ears are open, their hearts are open, but they're great. There's a, there are a lot of people who didn't join us today who have questions. And so we're going to clear some things up tonight before we move forward in the book of Revelation. You know, we studied about the seals. We actually did. And one of the keys in the seals that were broken was what happened to the main body of Christ. Well, that took place. In the first seals, you see, there's a key word to a great many people who came out of tribulation that nobody could number. But the key word is they came out of great tribulation. That's Revelation 7, verse 14. They came out of great tribulation. Where were they? Inside tribulation. Inside what type of tribulation? In great tribulation. But they came out. They came out of great tribulation. Before we started this, I had mentioned to you guys, there's a difference between the Jew and the Gentile. Just like a lot of people dispute this, and they'll say, well, you know, we're Jews too. Yes, but did you go through the Holocaust? No, you didn't. You didn't go through the Holocaust. But the word is very specific. In Revelation chapter 7, verse 14, that we will be in the Great Tribulation. See, here's a problem with the Great Tribulation. Not many will notice it's the Great Tribulation. See, what they're looking for is this time that is so bad on their flesh that they can't hardly make it. Listen, why in the world would Satan waste his time attacking your flesh when he wants your soul? You see, Satan wants you to turn away from the Holy One of Israel, who is Jesus Christ. He wants you to turn away from Jesus Christ. See, if he takes your life, he does not win your soul. He can't turn you against God. He wants you to turn against the Most High. That's what he wants. The book of Job is important to that because each and every time it was said to Job, why don't you just curse God and die? He didn't. He didn't. He went through trial after trial after trial, and he didn't do it. You see, but here's a lesson. We have gone through trial after trial after trial, and it has pushed some of us to extraordinary limits. But we didn't do it. We did not do it. We maintained. But for some people, they gave in. They have given in already. They're falling away. One of the greatest deceptions that could ever take hold of the inhabitants of the earth is that they not realize that they reside inside the most deceiving times of times. 
Is that understandable to you all? To deceive a person, you must not know the person is in a position where they can be deceived. Somewhat like a delusional person does not know they're inside of a delusion. But I'm telling you now, the things that Jesus said that were coming, were standing in the middle of some of them. You see, because he said the time was at hand back in Paul's day. Well, it's 2,000 years is that span of time. For a great And a great many things have happened. However, the tumultuous time is on its way. But we know that a great many people came out of great tribulation. And it's against the soul of man. The soul of man. This is why the world is not going to know anything until it comes and takes them all away. Okay, and... A great many people are standing in the place that they think is coming, but they're standing in the middle of it. Here's one thing. A lot of people, they don't know. We see that these people came out of great tribulation. We see that. We know that the seventh seal, in the seventh seal, this is important for you guys to remember. In the seventh seal, the seven angels were stood before God. To them were given seven trumpets. This is when he opened the seventh seal. There was silence in the heavens. The trumpets were handed to the seven angels. Now hear me. The trumpets are not the vials of wrath. The trumpets are not the vials of wrath. But so we have one fact figured out. The number that no man can number of all peoples, tongues, kindreds, nations... Right? It came out of great tribulation. In chapter 8 of Revelation, it says this, And I saw seven angels which stood... First of all, it says, When I had opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. They were handed the seven trumpets at the seventh seal. Seven trumpets were given at the seventh seal. Now, of course, we went through the trumpets, which were bad. They were bad. Not one was good. Here's one I want to entertain first. Back to the first angel again. The hail, fire, mingled with blood. I'll tell you this now. This same happening. There's a band before this that's coming here. And I believe they said two years after that band gets here, the iron core particles follow close behind that band. The iron core particles. So the hail fire mingled with blood were cast upon the earth. And a third part of the trees were burned up and all the green grass was burned up. That's the first angel sounding the trumpets. Now the findings dictate that these are four years away. Four years away. But there's another band before it. Before that fourth year. There's another band before it. Now, I know you guys are kind of burned out on science and what's coming in this, that, and the other, right? But they're kind of like uh, thunderstorms. Thunderstorms, they can forecast thunderstorms, but it's ultimately up to the Father. What he allows to form or not to form. This band, however, is seven times the size of our solar system. All planets will be affected. All of them will be affected. This will burn up all the green grass. All of it will be burned up. One third of the trees will likely suffer, but you have to look at the continents. And which continents contain one third of the trees? Contain the trees. Now, if you take the continents that contain the trees, the jungles, and so forth, then you'll see it. You'll see it. But this is an actual happening. 
that's being watched very closely. And you know what? This is why they hit themselves in the mountains. The people who are rich and those who run these governments, who are on the inside, have direct knowledge of such things, but they won't tell the public. They won't. They predicted the Haiti earthquake. They predicted the Chilean earthquake, but they didn't tell us all. They didn't tell us all. They just let people die. In the sixth seal, the sixth seal is documented before I said it was in 130 other places. I was wrong. It's 146 places. 146 places among 146 cultures, the sixth seal is written. It is written. I find that amazing. Now, that, that could, well, not really amazing. But the same happening is confirmed throughout the earth. It's confirmed. And I believe that these blood moons that we're experiencing are contained in the sixth seal. What makes these blood moons different from the others is what is involved with it in space. You see, the last blood moons, our planets were not expanding. All of them are expanding. The last blood moons, they did reveal wars and great strides on Earth. But, you see, we couldn't see what was happening in the heavens. And if we couldn't see what was happening in the heavens, it couldn't be this blood moon, because the whole world can't see things at one time. What makes these different? Now when the Bible says the whole world will see this, and the whole world will see that, then, now, right now, through instant communication, the whole world can see what's going on in any region on the earth. And thanks to Google, that will really be the end of that. You see, the more places communication can reach, it just uh, confirms the prophecy even more. Do you guys see that? So it couldn't happen with the other blood moons. The technology was not in place yet. Prophecies will be fulfilled. And if you follow prophecies, even the ones when Jesus was here, they happened just as they were written. I read some documents about the Pharisees who metaphorically tried to discern the prophecies about Jesus Christ and they missed it. Why? Because they metaphorically attempted to solve them. That's what they did. That's why nobody knew who Jesus was. Had they discerned the prophecies correctly, they would have known Jesus was walking the face of the earth. But you see, they metaphorically discerned the scriptures. And in their own pride and haughtiness, they missed the whole thing. But the problem was not that they missed it. The problem was they defended their own knowledge, even in the face of the Son of God. How terrible would that be? We all have differences of opinion on the details of the word. But I'm telling you now, with Jesus coming through the air, I'll renounce everything I said and say, well, forget my knowledge was really worth nothing. But the Pharisees didn't do it. They defended their knowledge even in the face of the Son of God. And, of course, we know they were absolutely 100% wrong because they thought it was metaphorical. And you know what? A lot of people think Revelation is metaphorical. They thought the Holocaust was metaphorical. But I told you before, the Holocaust is in the Bible. They did get their heads shaved. They burned them like trees. They did. But you see, a lot of people thought that was metaphorical. And my grandmother specifically told me during that time, people would not listen because they thought they figured it out. They thought it was metaphorical yet again, and it wasn't. It was reality. It's exactly what happened. And a small portion of them was dispersed throughout the earth and then bought back again. That's what happened, literally happened. And God did show miracles when they, when they 
had uh, Jerusalem when they got Jerusalem back in the 60s. Miracles did happen during that time. But everybody wants to discount that and go back to metaphorical things. You see, half of that is mankind's fault because they'll never show you what's real in the heavens. People don't even, they, they, they have a hard time comprehending what an angel is. But I'm going to share some things with you tonight about some actual happenings on this world that contained actual operations of angels. That was absolutely in the Bible. You guys know who King Arthur is, right? And all the warriors of that day. You guys know about the Justinian plague, the Black Plague, Spanish influenza. You guys know about that, right? They consumed many, many lives. All of them had one thing in common. Every single time before a plague ever hit the earth, People saw shields in the sky. Now, we know shields can't fly, which is to say they saw objects in the sky. You remember what Ezekiel saw? Wheels within a wheel? I've seen the pictures of what they attempted to describe. That's not what I see. But whenever I revisit that, I don't see what everybody else saw. I see something else. It's almost like I can see something that is. But see, you guys don't know that 10,000 years ago, they had little tiny sculptures of things with six wings on it. They had man's faces with helmets on them. Breastplates, beautiful breastplates. But they had six wings that did not move. They weren't flying six wings. They had six wings that did not move. They had some kind of something on their vests. All of them had swords. I've seen these sculptures. Most of them are locked away from public eye. They're unbelievable. And, you know, they had some really good artists back in the day. Really good artists. They didn't have TV to distract them like we do. But they had really good artists. And these small, these, uh, they, well, they had big and small. These things did exist. In fact, they found these same six-winged individuals all over the place. And they were exactly alike. There was a set of them. Four. There were four. They looked exactly alike. No, because the Lord described things with six wings, did he not? Full of eyes. They had wings full of eyes. So did these sculptures. They were full of eyes. You know what that's telling me? Not six wings, I'm sorry. You know what it's telling me, though? Some These people saw things, and they replicated what they saw. Some of the vehicles that they saw that they said were golden shields are absolutely a staff. I mean, down to the most minute of details. Some of the troops that walked the earth, that they said were in the earth, that went back up into the heavens, were absolutely beautiful. And what they wore was beautiful. And all of them had shields. But they had descriptions. See, they hide these things away from the public so that mankind will not believe in angelic beings, good or bad. They don't want to believe in it. You know what people think angelic beings are? A good feeling or something like that. They don't believe that they're actual individuals. And they are actual individuals, just not human individuals. They're made eternal they don't die. They're made eternal. Now that we see these angels at work in Revelation, that throws everybody off, and then they want to call it metaphorical. When this meteor shower comes, that's not going to be metaphorical. That won't be metaphorical. When these demonstrations do come, they won't be metaphorical. Everybody's warning about the weather. People still think it's for money. But when their houses are toppled and their hopes go down the drains, that won't be metaphorical either. But if you notice, going based off the Word of God, 
There are a great many people missing in the sixth seal. They were taken out of great tribulation in the sixth seal. In the sixth seal, they were taken out. And you had 144,000 sealed. Then the trumpets blew. But the Lord said something in the older books that Israel had to stay to the end. They had to stay to the end. Daniel had a vision concerning his people, his land. Did you guys know that? Daniel had a vision concerning his people and his land. Specifically, his people and his land. Now, that's hard for people to understand until it begins to happen. But he specifically was given a vision for his people and his land. Notice Jesus said, those in Judea flee to the mountains, not those in any other country. Those in Judea. Why? Because he said Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot for 42 months. That is when Satan wears out the saints of the Most High. That's when he does that. He'll wear out the saints of the Most High that are there. Did you know in special operations that the guillotines, all the guillotines in America, people are to be trained on them and shipped overseas to the Middle East. Are you guys aware of this? See, not many people are aware of this. Now, why would they train soldiers over here on the guillotine? By the way, they're training Russians to use them. They're training people in uh, Saudi Arabia to use them. The Egyptians have been trained to use them. Those in Israel have been trained to use them. Now, why in the world would they do this and then ship them all overseas? You see how the lies... It made people think these just weird things based on a lie. The entire fight is going to be against Israel. The entire fight. The abomination of desolation takes place where? In Israel, not in Cambodia. It takes place in Israel. Daniel saw a vision concerning his people. You know, when other people are talking about Daniel's prophecies, I don't argue with him. I don't argue. You know what? I'll never dispute things about prophecy. But I will always encourage someone to get Christ in their life. But I don't dispute things about prophecy. I know something about prophecy, and it's this. But that prophecy is going to happen. And if a person believes in their own understanding, even if I believe in my own understanding above what will actually take place, I'm the one that's deceived. I'm the one that's deceived. My method is simple. I read the word and I believe it. God gives a revelation. All of it matches up. There, there's, there's no place in the Bible that contradicts another place unless a person has misinterpreted something. I can't apply my own wisdom to the Bible. It doesn't work. It won't work. My wisdom is counted as nothing. I will not lean onto my own understanding, despite what I've seen. I still won't lean onto my own understanding. I could have a star out of the world and be the greatest engineer of all time, and I still won't lean onto my own understanding. What I've learned here, I've learned from men. That's not God's knowledge. All of us will eventually determine the details of his prophecies. Right now, I can only go by the Word of God, and the Word interprets the Word. I don't have to interpret it. The Word interprets the Word. Just like in the book of Daniel, it said, I will show you the meaning of the vision concerning your people. That was specifically given to Daniel. That's why they didn't believe it when the Holocaust came about. They, did, they just did not believe it. Every time my grandmother told me that story, she cried about it. But they didn't, they didn't believe it. They have a hard time believing that anything in the Bible is not metaphor. They have a hard time believing it. All because men teach things that, are, that were real. They teach them to be fables. People are going to find out very quickly that most of the fables in this world, they have truth in them. And most of the facts that are established in this world are simply lies. 
that will begin to upset a person's lifestyle. And because the fables are true, they're going to think that everything connected to them are evil. They now think the Bible is a fable. They're going to think the Bible is evil. Why? Because it corrupts their control. People love to have control over their own lives. They do not like the idea that God is in control of everything. They don't like that. They want to have control over their own lives. That's a spirit release in this world. That's an adaptation to the human psyche. And people, even Christians, get upset when they lose control over something. They don't like the idea of not having control. They don't. People see that when they're married. The husband will put something in one place. The wife will put it back in another. And then they're arguing over where something goes. Because one of them wants control. And when one goes to sleep, whatever it was that was moved goes back to the other position. The other one wakes up and they move it back. They want control. Leaders of the world feel they have control. But they have to keep their slaves, you, happy. So that you will never know the truth of anything. By the way, that's part of Roman philosophy. To entertain you so much. But to balance your work ethic. To support their systems while doing so. That's a theology of how to keep a prisoner free. But you're still a prisoner. That's a very twisted theology. That's a theology. So again... These seals, when the seals are broken in the seventh seal, clearly defines that the angels get the trumpets and they begin to sound. But you know what? When the trumpets blow, not many people are going to make it through the trumpets. And we discuss the fifth angel sounding. Star that fell from heaven onto earth and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Many people think that's metaphorical. Yet they have no close observation on Black and white images of the moon, never in color. Why, why don't you see anything in color? Why did they not give you any pictures of the moon in color? Anybody ever? The moon is not bone white in a gray. The moon is not in grayscale. It's not in grayscale. Why did they not show you pictures of the moon in color? I'll tell you why. If they showed you a picture of the moon in color, you would instantly be upset you will also begin to question everything else. You can pick out definition when color is present. That's what happens. Have you ever looked at a black and white photo of a field? Your brain will automatically determine shapes, but you'll never notice the flowers. You'll never notice the little bees in the grass. You'll never notice those details. But when it's in color, you can then distinguish the squirrels that were in the picture. But when it's in black and white, your eyes pick out patterns, and then it becomes a blurred mesh. So they'll never show you high-resolution color photos of the moon. They won't do it. They have them, but they won't show them to the public. You know how many people petitioned? the government to do that, and when they petitioned the government to do that, do that, they lost their jobs. My dad told me about that. He told me about that. It was ridiculous. Mars is always red. They don't want you to see the details there either. In fact, they made a mistake, and one of the rovers took a color photo of Mars, and it looked exactly like Arizona with green trees, with green in the background, some type of plant life, and, of course, other things like maybe a form of mold or, or moss or something like that. They don't want you to see that stuff. You know why? Because it would open your eyes up to say, you know what? I think the uh, fallen angels are dwelling there. Something is what, what is living on there. And then you'd begin to realize the characters in the Bible are real. That these angels are all over the solar system. But they are in fact angels. You guys know that angel means messenger. 
that sons of God is a is that that term sons of God is equated to those from the heavens. Sons of God is equated to those in the heavens. There was another great deception when Zechariah Central was given knowledge of the Sumerian text. They didn't document anything he published. Yes, they were called the Anunnaki. Do you know what they see when you hear the word Anunnaki? Automatically you've been trained to think, oh, oh that's bad stuff. Am I right? When you think Anunnaki. The word Anunnaki means those who from the heavens came. That's what the word Anunnaki means. Those who from the heavens came. See, you didn't know one of the Anunnaki's names equated to Gabriel. You didn't know that one of the Anunnaki's names equated to Michael and Uriel and Raphael. You didn't know Nephilim, the bad Anunnaki that fell to earth. Those who will hold back both fire and winds after the Euphrates River dries up. You didn't know all that resides in the true Sumerian text that they withheld from the public. And the UK was highly upset because they were supposed to share the truth with the world. You didn't know that An, Anu, Enlil, Inki, Nehersa, all those characters were misnamed on purpose to throw you off so that you would never look at it again to see any truth in there. You see, you can't trust what was published. It would be disastrous for you to know the truth. But I submit to you something. If you read the Bible and quit don't think that everything in here is metaphorical, but ask the Lord to show you in the Bible what the meaning of things are. Like when he says the beast, all you have to do is keep reading, and he defines the beast. I've heard people say, they say, yeah, the beast coming out of the water, well, the only thing that's near water is Rome. And the beast came out of the water means that the island rose. No, you should have kept reading. The water are many people. The beast came out of many people. The waters represent people. You see, they didn't read the whole thing, and they took one thing out of context and missed the entire subject. They became wise in their own eyes, and they took a scripture and ran with it, and they leaned unto their own understanding and, and gave themselves the interpretation and missed the whole thing. They missed it. They don't know that the seven heads are the seven mountains that surround Israel. Has anybody ever told you that? The seven heads are the seven mountains that surround Israel. Hmm. Anunnaki means those who from the heavens came. Some were good, some were bad. Michael the archangel is not bad. Gabriel is not bad. They, too, in the Sumerian text are called Anunnaki. Anunnaki simply means those who from the heavens came. In other words, Anunnaki means angel. Satan is an angel. See, you got angels of light and angels of darkness, don't you? Angel, Anunnaki. Nowadays, what do we call them? Who come from the heavens? If you come from the heavens, you're an extraterrestrial. Now you're starting to see it? Are you guys starting to see it? Throughout the cultures, they named those who came from the heavens different names. Angels in the Bible, Anunnaki in Sumerian times, extraterrestrials in our time. You see, some, it's hard for people to put that out. It's not hard. It's like saying the same thing in different languages. And that's exactly what it is. The same thing in different languages. But it's offensive to people if you take the word angel away. So I tend to use angel, but they still can't make the connection. Did you know that Alexander, Alexander witnessed, you know when those angels were sent to Daniel? Alexander witnessed their arrival because he said they were going to Babylon at that time. I'm not going to get into that. They were fighting the king of Persia at that time, the prince of Persia. One shield showed up. 
Nobody on either side knew what to think of this shield, but it helped out Alexander. It was fighting against the king of Persia. Then another one showed up, and that was the end of that fight. And then both of them vanished. But Daniel said, Daniel said, in the book of Daniel, it says Gabriel came, but he withstood the prince. The, the prince withstood him for 21 days, and he had to go get Michael to help him out. You guys remember that? Michael the archangel had to help him out so he could get the word to Daniel. That's a strange correlation. Isn't it? But you see, people will discount that one too. You know why? Because it brings the angels into a reality they're not ready for. That's why. The Bible says, be careful to entertain strangers because you entertain angels unaware. So guess what? You're not going to know what they look like. They can take the form of anybody. They can be that bum on the street you laughed at. They can be the person in the store that you saw, that you felt, and saw one time. And you turn around again and they weren't even there. They can be the helping hand that shows up in your life. And you say, thank you. You go back to what you're doing and turn around and look and say, oh, up it, and they're gone. They can come and visit you at your work site. They can be a patient. They can be anybody. Nobody believes in that stuff. Nobody believes in that stuff because it brings truth in the realm of reality. And when something's in the realm of reality, we have to deal with it. It changes our comfort zone in our world. And then if it changes our comfort zone in the world, we think, oh, i got to rethink everything I know. So in, a, in effect, you think you're dethroned or something. That's called being delusional, by the way. I just want you to know that. It's called being delusional. See, the world, in the New Testament, it said they knew not until the flood waters came and took them all away. You know why? They didn't believe in anything. I can see them now with meteors coming down. Oh, it's just a one out of a billion chance. I can see them when the rain was falling. Oh, this will probably not ever happen again. And then it kept falling. Oh, we can deal with this. We'll go to higher ground. And then it kept falling. Oops, there's no higher ground to go to. Then the dams burst in the earth and the bowels of the earth opened up and the water overtook them. And then they said, oh, help me. Too late. Too late. That's what's happening now. Oh, we don't believe in angels. They're, they're not, you know, angels are like little things you put on fireplaces. Yet, nobody can dispute that people all over this globe are seeing lights and strange vehicles in the sky, correct? And we no longer believe it's swamp gas. But I told you guys a long time ago, wherever you see one of these things, look at that area to see what's happening in that area. Something always happens in an area where they appear. That's all you have to do. Look at the results of where they are spotted from. You know, the Lord said he would not have us ignorant concerning the devices of the enemy. That to his children, he does not work things in secret. Now, the information can be obtained. It's thrown to your face all the time. We just choose to ignore it. Instead of using the wisdom the Lord gave us, we ignore things. All you have to do is check where people see these things, and you'll notice a residue, a common residue in the entire area. They change things wherever they go. In fact, all of the great plagues of Earth were preceded by lights in the sky, death and carnage were preceded by lights in the sky. You see, mankind always did one thing. They documented whatever they saw. They couldn't help themselves. We do the same thing. It's called a journal. We keep journals. We have newspapers and everything else. They did the same thing. They did the same thing.
but the planet, but the moon, you see, everybody is soon to find out about the planets. I'm telling you now, it's going to be scary to a lot of people. In fact, just to find out about the moon and give people a heart attack. Because people have natural fears of things that they have no power over. No human being has a power over the angels that God sends. You see, angels are always working. Everybody thinks they're at the throne right now relaxing. Well, that's not the truth. That's not what the Word says. The Word did not say they were just sitting up in heaven relaxing. It's not what the Word says. They are at work. And what do they do? They carry out the work of the Lord. Whatever work he assigns him to do, he does it, just like Satan. Satan was on his job with Job. Satan was on his job in the garden. Satan was on his job with Cain. In Babylon, everywhere else, he's on his job. So are the other angels. You know who makes, you know who employs the angels? We do. When you agree with the word of God, you send your angels appointed to you to work. When you agree with the kingdom of Satan, you send demons to work. You'll come into an agreement with one side or the other with everything you do. It just so happens as a believer of Christ, you have power and authority over them. You become a marvel to the angel themselves. They desire to be with you and pray They're out of curiosity and out of wanting to know. They want to be with you and your worship and everything else. That's written in the Bible also. These are things that people don't discuss. The Lord gave you power over the enemy. All spirits are subject unto you. That means all demons are subject unto you. You have power to tread upon scorpions and serpents. Why a scorpion and why a serpent? Why? Because both have venom. Both have venom. Don't people in your lives have venom? Can't they say things that will send you off the edge? He gave you the power to overcome it. So why do we still give in to it if he gave you the power to overcome it? Both scorpions and serpents have venom. And he gave us the power to overcome it. You know, someone had asked earlier what the bride of Christ was. That's something else we're going to learn in context. Those same people who wonder who, who really, they, they argue about the bride of Christ. But I'll say this before we ever let the word define it. is that the Lord was married once, but he gave a letter of divorce. Everybody knew, everybody knew that, right? Everybody know that? God gave a letter of divorce because he had a hard-headed, stiff-necked wife. He had a hard-headed bride. And why did he give her a letter of divorce? Because she committed fornication. She caused all the nations. She caused the fury of the Lord to come down upon all nations. Through her, God would have changed the world. Just like through you, he would change a nation. But just like her, we did the same things. Instead of humbling ourselves and praying, we did something else. Then we point at the nation saying it's the problem when the problem is not the nation, it's us. Let me give an example. What, what do you think would happen if everybody in America sat at home one day and said, well, I'm not doing anything else until this happens, this happens, this happens. Do you understand what would happen? There would be no power in the government. Because the people would, they would quickly learn that the people constitute the government. If everybody said, no, I'm just not doing it. Hey, you guys get it right in the White House. What do you think would happen? Through you, a nation can be healed. The land can be healed. Through Israel, the world could have been changed. But Israel committed whoredoms. 
over and over again. This is why people have a problem with the whore of Babylon, what they call the whore of Babylon. God called Israel a harlot, the great harlot of the earth. That's what God called Israel, the great harlot of the earth, because she committed whoredoms with the kings of the earth. And see, when it says she had mystery Babylon written across her forehead, that's because you would never, ever guess she'd be anything like Babylon. It's not because God hates her. It's because she was first his. She's already married, but devoted herself to everybody else. And through her treachery, everybody else has to pay. Through her treachery. And so she has to be trampled on for 42 months. She'll be cleansed again. That's why Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, those in Judea flee to the mountains. Where's Judea? Anybody know where Judea is? What Judea is? Those in Judea flee to the mountains. Because in Revelation it says Jerusalem, that holy city, will be trampled underfoot for 42 months. For 42 months. That's from Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. She'll be trampled underfoot for 42 months. So the whole key here is around Jerusalem. It's around Jerusalem. And that whole key happened in the Holocaust. That's why nobody outside of the Jews were in the Holocaust. It specifically said that the Jews at that time would be shaved bald, burnt like trees and everything else, and that's what happened from the Holocaust. Nobody else endured the Holocaust. Nobody else. Everything that has happened on earth is for a reason, for our clarity. Everything is for our clarity. But again, people of old times, like my grandmother, they cried concerning the Holocaust because nobody would listen to the scriptures. They said it was metaphorical. And then it happened. Even, even I didn't know they were warned so much during that time. I didn't know that. But they were warned so much, and they didn't listen. And they had to endure the Holocaust. No other nation endured the Holocaust. Because they thought the words of God were metaphorical. All they had to do was read. The Lord proves his word over and over again by explaining it several different ways. The same thing several different ways. And yet they still denied the knowledge that God gives. They denied it. They wanted to know it for themselves and within their own understanding. That's where they failed. And I'll tell you this, a great many people will do that too. Doesn't mean they're bad. It's just that's how they believe. The, the problem with that is, for any of us, if we believe a certain way, and we dictate that's just the way it's going to be, and the opposite happens, and if we're bound by our own words, we're going to have a conniption fit within ourselves. You see, we're the ones that fall. We feel like we have been disappointed. But if we trust in our own, that's why the Bible says, lean not unto thine own understanding. Don't do it. They said, don't do it. First of all, we're not smart enough to figure out these things in the Bible. Revelation is given from the Holy Spirit oh, by God. It's given to the entire body of Christ. One person is not going to have all the answers for everybody. Jesus came and did that once, and this is how a great many people are going to be fooled. I hope you guys hear this. A great many people are going to be fooled because in that same way, one man is going to come and have many answers for everybody. It does not work that way. Jesus was the only begotten son of the Father. Within him, everything was stored. When he released the Holy Spirit to the world, because he said, I won't leave you alone. I'm going to send you the comfort. 
this went out to the entire body of Christ. God's word goes out to the entire body of Christ, not just one individual. And many people are about to get trapped again because they're going to listen to one person. They're going to say, yes, this person has all the answers. Jesus already warned us of this. He already warned us of this. That false prophets, you know what? A false prophet has all the answers. They can defy everything in your spirit. Yet many people will follow that false answer. Just this one person. It will never bear witness in your spirit. But you'll throw your spirit to the side and follow this person. You'll surrender to the person rather than surrender to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And they'll be sneaky. They'll divert you more and more away from the words of God and into a different type of understanding. And the Bible was clear about people who present something other than this doctrine, what their origins are from. Folks, we're going to take a break and happy birthday, Kimmy. I forgot my own birthday. I really did. Tell Angie, reminded me. I always forget my birthday, though. But I like to celebrate other people's birthdays. So I would sing you a birthday song, Kimmy, but you don't have your uh, ear plugged in yet, so I can't do it. Folks, I'll be right back. I'm going to take a short break. I hope you're not getting bored. Much more to come. I'll be right back. Okay. Am I back? Yeah, I'm back. I'm back. I am back. All right, where were we? Oh, I got I got something I want to share with you guys. One day when I was small, right, we had this tree in our front yard. I dreamt about this tree. At the bottom, it had no fruit. At the middle, it had pollen. At the top, it had fruit, but it was a pine tree. Now, I was little. I was little. I told my parents, I said, listen, I had a dream about that tree. It's going to have fruit at the top. They said, no, it's not. And I said, yes, it is, because I dreamt it. You know, in that time, I did trust my dreams. I did. I trusted them. Well, as time went on, that tree had no fruit at the top. By the way, it was a pine tree. And, you know, I'm a little kid, right? But I thought it was going to have fruit at the top of the pine tree. And they kept telling me it's going to have no fruit, but I dreamt about it. And I could feel it was an important dream. Well, come to find out after many years, that tree that looked exactly like the tree in our front yard did not was not going to have fruit in it. That tree was the tree of me, of stages I would go through. At the bottom, it didn't have anything. It was simply a tree. In the middle, it had pollen. Only at the top did it have fruit. At the very top, the fruit was. But it represented me. It wasn't something that was actually going to happen. Many of us do the same thing. We do it with the Word of God. We'll look at it and interpret it. But you know what? I submit to you something. When you have an interpretation and the Lord has shown you something that's called a pearl, that's a pearl. Don't cast your pearls before swine. You see, sometimes it takes an event to happen so we can actually dictate what we were shown because you won't understand what you were shown until certain events take place. It's a pearl. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Don't do it. This is why we have different, we see things in Revelation differently. Now with me, I read it line by line. In fact, I'm just reading the word of God to you and relating things as they relate to small happenings in there. But I don't form a picture out of my own understanding because 
I have an un- and it takes a revelation of events so that I have the full understanding. If you cast your pearls before swine, they'll trample on your pearl, then turn and tear you to pieces. Don't cast your pearls before swine. Just like that tree did not bear fruit in the natural. I had to wait till later on in life to understand what that tree represented. See, it made sense to me, but it made sense to nobody else. We don't try to figure out everything here. We read things line by line. We let God give the revelation. We can't give revelation. And my wisdom is not good wisdom to get revelation from. Unless it's biblically founded, just the way the Bible said it is. That's right. Let God be God. But some of the pearls that we have are given directly to us, for us, not for anybody else, but for us. That happened many times in the Old Testament, that they were given something for them. And we're given things for us as individuals. Now, well, I forgot what I'm, oh, we were talking about. How people don't think things are real that are real. Like Leviathan. Like Behemoth. Leviathan has a history. Because he's written down in many other cultures with the same thing. Not only in the Hebrew text. Not only in the Aramaic text. Not only in the Greek text. Not only in Jewish culture. But in Indian culture. Asian cultures, African cultures. There was first a creature named Leviathan. They found the rib cage. The rib cage is far bigger than you could possibly. You wouldn't even think a creature could be that big on Earth because you couldn't fit but a handful on Earth in the first place. But then its spirit still continues. There's a demonic entity whose name is Leviathan. What a coincidence. There's also a demonic entity whose name is Behemoth. What a coincidence. But then again, a lot of people don't believe in demons. So Leviathan being one of the stronger, stronger ones, the ones who can, uh, uh, take a communications platform and split it open from the middle with, let's see, 28 witnesses. How do you take a a titanium-reinforced communications platform But you see, men will interpret this a different way. Then what they do is they try to find how something fits. I don't do that. I'll wait on God's revelation. I'm not going there. I don't make anything fit. The Lord wrote what he wrote. He inspired this to be written. I take it as it is. God gives revelation. And I found that if we wait, we find out the word is absolutely the word. And I'm the dodo who interpreted it the wrong way. And you know, sometimes you feel you don't want to be the dodo, right? So I'm not going to, I don't expend my time doing that. I know God's going to give the revelation, but to the whole body. There are often times, even in COT, we get a revelation of the same thing at the same time. When a word is given from the Lord is replicated throughout the world, just what happened yesterday, that same word is going out today. But these are precepts of men. This is what Isaiah was talking about. Learning the word of God based on the precepts of men. From theologians, philosophers, and so forth. God said he was not pleased with that. He was not pleased with that. But this is why 
when we read the word, so much confusion begins to come because you're fighting the precepts of men and sometimes are so deeply rooted that it, it just ruins the truth of the word and it takes years. That's why a person can read the scriptures seven times and get seven different things from it because you're fighting the precepts of men every single time. If your brain was blank like mine, I don't have precepts of men. I don't. I really don't. I have not been under anybody else's, um, you know, doctrine that turned out to be severely false. I have always stuck to the word of God and not men's words. Men's words do not stay with me. It's almost like I forget them. Empty head. I have an empty head. And the knowledge that I did have, I don't want it because it's useless. I have knowledge I have gained over the years that is absolutely useless. Useless. What good is it to have many, many engineering skills, right? When all, everything that was engineered is wiped out. What good is that? That's like having cooking skills in the middle of a desert where there's no food or water. It's no good. You need survival skills, not cooking skills. It won't matter at that time if you know how to mix seasons together. If you know what temperature to preheat the oven to cook this and that, it's not going to matter. Same thing. Same thing with me. Many of the things that I learned serve their purpose for the time. But when it comes to the Word of God, I do not mix the two. I can give examples of those things that men don't believe because I've seen them with my own eyes. But I'm not here to interpret the Word of God. The Word of God interprets itself. You know, the Lord requires a witness most of the time, doesn't he? Well, the Bible is a witness unto itself. It's written in more places than one. We just have to go and do the investigation, reading everything in the context, which is to read the entire book. Sometimes you can't read just one chapter and think you understand it all. It won't work like that. You have to read the entire thing or you, you, you'll get way off. And when I also follow God's order, I don't make up my own order. We know that the Lord does everything he likes, his sets of numbers, right? Forty days and nights, key number. Seven years, key number. Twelve is a key number. The Lord works in this order. It's not a mystery. He works in that order. These things we have to understand. We have to understand them. Hold on, folks, just a moment. Okay, I'm back. And no, I didn't reveal what should be classified. I'll save that for Pastor Paul. That's for his, you guys are in, you guys hear me every day. I'll reveal that to Pastor Paul's show. What has recently been declassified. Maybe I can talk about that tomorrow. It's pretty good things. You you know, the hardest part now is breaking these yokes and chains from previous knowledge. I found through life I have to unlearn those things I did learn, not trusting the precepts of men. I never, ever am against anyone who ever, who ever perpetuated a precept of man, because guess what? They didn't know either. Usually, one person learns something from another. That person learns it from another. That person learns it from another. There you go. There you go. That's what happens. It becomes common knowledge. And then it's stuck in people's uh, brains. So, sometimes you have to unlearn what you learn. Anyway, let's continue on with Revelation. Now, before we stopped last time... We discussed those things that happened prior to the beast getting here, and I explained to you guys that the beast system is being set up. The beast system is being set up. In fact, the beast system is already established. It really is. The beast system is already established. Have you noticed that when the beast does come, he automatically goes straight into power? 
He goes straight into power. But here's a cruel thing. Here's, here's a wake-up call. The world worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast. They worshipped the devil. They worshipped Lucifer. I told you guys before that a great many people in high places who run these countries and corporations have already said that people who do not take the Luciferian initiate will live in the new era. They said they won't live in the new era. And by any means, they'll kill them themselves if they have to. Which is what they're going to do. That's why people get beheaded. But they said they will not enter the new era. They won't. It amazes me that in Revelation 13, I found in Revelation 13, in Revelation 12, the serpent was cast to the earth with his angels. Prior to Revelation 12, he was just cast out of heaven with his angels. Him and his angels were cast out of heaven. But Satan himself was going back and forth to the throne, accusing the people of God day and night. That's what he was doing. We see that Revelation 12, verse 10. It says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation, the strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. By the way, Revelation told on everybody right here. The bases in the oceans, it just told on them right here. Those that that be inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, told on them big time. I mean, this should be classified, verse 12 should be, but nobody classified it. Because they do have habitations in the floors of the ocean. You know, the floors of the ocean that they say is impossible to get to because of the pressure, right? The pressure is just so much they can't get anything down there. They told on them. Did I hear somebody say they lied to us again about that? Yes, they did. So when Satan is cast to the earth, he persecutes Israel. Then he persecutes the offspring because he can't quite get to the core of Israel. Then the beast forms in the earth in chapter 13. But I want you to notice something. Look at the look at the description of the beast. And I sit up on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now hear me again. He had seven heads. Ten horns, ten crowns, and upon his head the names of blasphemy. So he had seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns. Now the heads, the horns, and the crowns all mean something different. You guys get this? Seven heads, ten horns. And ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. He had seven. It's important for you to remember he had seven. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. His power... His seat and his great authority comes from Satan. Yet, if his power, seat, and great authority came from Satan, and people say Satan has no authority in the earth, he's not running these kingdoms, they're deceiving themselves. Anyway, we'll continue. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. Here goes something you can kick out of your mind right away. Listen to me. It says, and I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. One of the heads was wounded, not the horn, 
and not the crown. One of the heads were wounded. And what else was on the heads? The name of blasphemy. Are you guys getting this? You writing this down? Trying to get you to see the structure of the beast. Not by any precept of men, but right out of the word of God. Nothing added to it. Nothing taken away. Because the Lord did say, those who add to the books, of, add to the uh, words of this prophecy, he'll add unto them the plagues that are contained in the prophecy. Those who take away from this prophecy, he'll take away their portion. Just, I'm not changing anything. I'm certainly not going to interpret anything by my own understanding, my own mouth. This is the wrong book to do it with because you can really lead people down the path of, of uh, destruction if you change anything or come up with your own conclusions or anything. So the beast, this is, Kathy, this is why I need you to hear it. The beast had seven heads, ten horns, and ten crowns, and upon his head's the name of blasphemy. Make sure you have that. Folks, hold on. we got to take one more break, and then we'll get right back to the beast. Hold on just a second. Okay, back in action. I'm getting charged up. So the beast has seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. Like, you got that? You guys got that? You got that? Now, the beast, oh, and upon his head, plural, upon his head, plural, the name of blasphemy. So upon his head, plural, the name of blasphemy. And the beast, which I saw, was like unto a leopard. He was like unto a leopard. And his feet were as the feet of a bear. And his mouth, as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who was able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name in his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. You know, a lot of people say, am I going to be in real trouble if I take the mark? Well, I'll tell you this. If you're in the Lamb's book of life, you won't take the mark. It's simple and plain. If you're not in the Lamb's book of life, you're going to take the mark. Simple and plain. How easy can that be? If your name is in the book of life, you are not going to take the mark. How do I know that? Because it says so right here. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life from the, of the, uh, lamb slain from the foundations of the world. That's not difficult. Just keep reading because the explanation is coming. If any man hath an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. Here's a, here's the second beast. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. And causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. Whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles, which he had power to do in sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. By the way, that wound by the sword 
is war. He had a wound by war, a fatal wound by war, but he did make, let's, let's continue. I don't want to jump ahead of myself because it's right here. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he calls us all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath, number one, the mark, number two, the name of the beast, or number three, the number of his name. Notice the or clause in there. Or, that's three specific things, the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Do you guys know that or clause in there? Or. Let me read it again. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Did you guys hear the or in there? That's three specific things. Hmm. How many people knew that? All right, let me continue. Here's wisdom. Like he that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Interesting. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in his foreheads. And I heard the voice from heaven, his voice in many waters, and as a voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung a new song, as it were, before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn the song but the 144,000, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with woman, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of wrath of her fornication. Let me say that one more time. And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Listen at the reason. L listen closely at the reason. Because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication was stopped. The wine of the wrath of her fornication. She made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What is the wrath of her fornication? God's wrath. Why would God have wrath over one nation's fornication? Because he was married to her. How can you fornicate if you're not married? What is the only nation that we know of that is married? Hmm, I think we read that in the Old Testament a couple of weeks ago. I do declare that we read a few scriptures that pertain to that nation. Let me continue. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. Hmm. Now that's an interesting statement. Blessed are they that die 
in the Lord from henceforth. I think he said that because here in verse 7, there was an angel that had the everlasting gospel. And when an angel says something with a loud voice, it penetrates into the ears of many. A call, a last call went out right here, right before the hour of his judgment has come. And right after that last call was given, it was said to them, Blessed are they which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, with a cloud upon the cloud, one that sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a lot. Let's stop right here. You know, I hear so much talk about the temple. I just want you guys to hear something. Because I got to stop. I actually got to stop right here and go back and get something else for you. But I want to stop right here on purpose so you can see something. And another angel came out of the temple. Where did the angel come out of? He came out of the temple. That's in verse 15. Crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thirst in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. I'm going to stop right there. Stop right there. Another angel came out of the temple. The other angels came out of heaven. Voices were coming out of heaven. But the angels were coming out of the temple. In the midst of heaven. It was in the midst of heaven. There's a reason why I had to stop there. Because we have some things we got to answer, right? We have some things we have to answer. We knew this was the hour of his judgment. Why? Because an angel proclaimed it. The angel that had the everlasting gospel proclaimed it. We saw an explanation of the beast. Yes, we did. Having his seven heads, ten crowns upon his head, and the names of blasphemy and the seven horns. We know that another beast came out from the land, who had all the power of the first beast, but this one could do miracles in sight of the beast. Now, the first beast was given his power and great authority in his seat by Satan himself. The second beast exercised all the power of the first beast. He was the one who made the world worship the beast. He did. But the world at this time, listen to who is left on earth. The world at this time, who did they worship? They worship the dragon that gave power to the beast. Hmm. We found out that the 144,000 were virgins. And that at this point they followed the lamb whithersoever he goeth. They were first fruits among men. No guile was found in their mouth. Boy, that counts a lot of us out. First fruits among men. A first fruit among men cannot be tainted. These 144,000 are first fruits among men. A lot of people, you know what, a lot of people dispute even the number of the 144,000, not knowing that the Bible clearly says they're sealed with the Holy Spirit, but it also says, they keep saying in Revelation, that people are getting their heads chopped off, that people are coming out of great tribulation, that people are under the altar, yet they refuse to believe that they'll go through anything, and they're in the middle of stuff right now. Do you see how dangerous that is? To ignore where you are and to say where you're not going? Why not just say, yes, Lord, I'll do your will. How about that one? You know, that makes everything so much easier. Because I'm not here to get out of anything. I'm here to serve the Lord because I love him. Not because I want something from him. Not because I want him to do something for me. But because I love him. And we felt that today in the chat room, by the way. There is no motive. 
There's no hidden agenda to serve the Lord, but I'll submit to you this. A great many people do have a hidden agenda. They'll say, well, if I don't serve the Lord, this bill won't get paid. So until this bill is paid, I'm going to walk the straight and narrow right after it's paid. Then I can cut up. People do that. They absolutely do it. People will serve the Lord so long as they are in need. When they're no longer in need, they go and toy in the world. And then those same people wonder, well, why is nothing in my life working out? Because the Lord loves you, that's why. And he knows he has to keep certain things from you because you'll corrupt yourself. And he does not want you lost. People do that. People absolutely do that. Some people want to be recognized. I don't serve the Lord for recognition. In fact, prior to being here on COT, I had expressed that I was going to be in the background. Angie knew that. I didn't want to talk to anybody. The Lord told me to set the table. I wanted to set the table. I did not want to be the vessel of which, you know, things would flow. Or I didn't expect to talk. I, I didn't expect to do this. Yet here I am doing this. Something I never did before. But doing this. Something I had zero interest in. Do you not realize that I love to help people in the background? Talking to them like this. In fact, most of the things in my life are things I never planned on doing. But see, when you obey the Lord, it happens that way. We have our plans, right? And the Lord has his preordained life for you. All too often, we try to make our plans work, right? Well, the Lord has, he's predestined you a certain way. And if we're not careful, if we force and make our will work, it never works. But if we just give up, if we just let go, then the Lord does the rest. And you can do nothing but trust him at that time because it all begins to work. Yeah, it's not working so good, MT, working in the background, because the background is a, it, that's a, what's a thought. It worked for a few months, that was it. So, folks, we saw a transition with the beast here. We did. We saw a transition. I'm submitting something to you today, based on the order given to us by God, because, listen, please hear me out. The seals opened one by one. Within the seventh seal, God said on the, the trumpets blew one by one. We don't know how quick they blew. We don't we don't know that. We do know that the last three are horrible. We know they're horrible. Why? Because of all the trumpets, you get the first one and all the green grasses burn up third of the trees. Then wormwood comes, which does not impact the earth. All wormwood does, listen to me. Can I clarify something, please? It's just, it's, it's on me. Please, let me clarify this. In Revelation chapter 8, verse 10, let me tell you what wormwood does. And a third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were lamp. And it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. And the name of the star is called wormwood. And the third part of the waters became wormwood or bitter, and many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. So the effect that wormwood has is people get poisoned because it poisoned the waters. Wormwood means bitter, so it made the waters bitter. It did not, you know, people say, oh, this big asteroid is wormwood and it's going to impact the earth and, and everybody's going to be in perpetual darkness. That is not what the Bible says. In fact, the second angel has more impact than Wormwood does. Let's read that one. And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. And the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died. And the third part of the ships were destroyed. And that was its cause and effect. Now, Gary and Lori, that could be red dust. 
that could be the red dust, but it fell into the sea. And its cause and effect was what? A third part of the ships that were in the sea were destroyed, and a third part of the creatures in the sea they had life died. That was the cause and effect. But even they peril. They peril from the impact of the first angel. Nobody ever, you know what, envision all the green grass burning up. Just I want you to envision that. Envision one third of the trees burned up. This says hail, fire, mingled with blood. They were cast upon the earth. The cause and effect of them is all the green grass was burned up. And a third part of the trees were burned up. That is horrific. That's horrific. But the angels never said, whoa, whoa, whoa to these. The angel never said, whoa to these. Now, when the fourth angel sounded, after the fourth angel sounded, right? I want you to look at the fourth angel sounding. You can't blow that one off. Yeah, we'll get to that, Kathy. But you can't blow the fourth angel sounding. Nobody ever mentions the fourth angel sounding. Let me explain this to you. In the fourth, as it was written, and the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars. So as a third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of them, and the night likewise. Do you all know what that means? That word smitten, by the way, in the Greek, almost equates to taken away or vanished. Well, if a third part of the sun is not showing, and a third part of the moon, and a third part of the sky cannot disappear, that means something is in the way of a third part of our view. So it blocks the sun and the moon and the stars. Something huge is right there in front of the earth. You guys getting that? That is huge. And when you know, when this thing is parked right there in front of the earth, when the fifth angel sounds, a star falls from heaven under earth, and to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. Apollyon comes to the earth. When that thing is sitting in front of the earth blocking a third part, you know, to block a third part of the sun and the moon and the sky, it's something very close to earth. That's in the fourth angel sounded. Then when the fifth angel sounded, Apollyon, who has a key to the bottomless pit, opens up the pit. I'm just saying, we have something sitting parked in front of the earth, obstructing the view, because a third part of the sky just simply can't disappear. Of course, the Lord can do whatever he wants. I can be absolutely wrong. But then something comes to earth right after that has a key to the bottomless pit. And then it says, then it says something to affirm the fact that something was parked in front of the earth, right? Because remember, only a third part of the day was showing in third part of the night also. But it says this, and he opened the bottomless pit, there rose smoke out of the pit. As a smoke of a great furnace in the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. You know, if we go on the Joel and read the same thing, we're looking at the something very similar. But that's the first one. See, the angel in Revelation 8, 13 said, Now beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpets of the three angels, which are yet to sound. The last three are terrible. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power. Scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, see, this got me, first of all. Why would something come out of the pit and God tell them or, or command them not to hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. And I started thinking, well, bugs eat that stuff. Can you imagine a vicious monster coming out of the pit? And he starts eating grass? I mean, that wouldn't be very scary. That'd be like a big cow coming out of the pit. But they were commanded not 
to touch the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree. But only those men who have not the seal of God on their foreheads. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should torment five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh the man. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of a woman, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sounds of chariots and many horses running into battle, and their tails like unto scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. That's not a good time to be in that situation. That's one woe is past. Then another one comes. And you know what? If we read the book of Joel, we get the same description of what's being released on the earth. Because the Lord specifically said, first of all, let's go to Joel real quick to clear something up further. Some of you may not have heard this. It's not coming from me. It's in Joel. Just please know that. It's not coming from me. It's in Joel. It's in, it's in Joel. I'm not saying anything. This is coming from Joel. That's what this is coming from, Joel. Now, let's, let's, let's look at Joel, chapter 2. Blow ye the trumpet of Zion, sound the alarm on holy mountain, that all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. And a great people are strong, there had not ever been the light, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoured before them, and behind them a flame burner. The land is as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen shall they run. Well, what, what, stop right there. It says, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains. This says, and he opened the bottom of his pit, and there rose smoke out of the pit, and the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun of the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Of course, the locusts came out of the pit, right? But when we get to the description, and the shapes of the locusts were like, and the horses prepared unto battle. Then we get to Joel, we go back to Joel. It says, a great people and strong, they are not been ever the like, neither shall be any more, even to many years, many generations, a fire devoured before them, and behind them a flame burneth. And the land is as a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. Let's keep going. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains, shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. As a strong people set in battle array. Did you capture that phrase? As a strong people set in battle array. Well, let's go into chapter 9 and see some. It says, And the saints of the locusts were like horses prepared unto battle, and their heads were as it were crowns of gold, and their faces were the faces of men. What? And they had hair as the hair of a woman, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates, and as it were breastplates of lions. And the sounds of their wings was as the sound of chariots, of many horsemen running into battle. Now, what did Joel just say? What, what did just say in Joel? Anybody? No. What, what? Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they eat. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth the stubble. Strong people set in what? Battle array. What is a breastplate? Battle array. Both of these individuals in Joel chapter 2 and in Revelation 9 are like horses. Wait a minute, let's keep going. 
Let's keep going. Before their fa- I'm mean, back in Joel chapter two. Before their faces shall much be pain. All faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. They shall march every one in his own ways, and they shall not break the ranks. Neither shall one thrust another. They shall walk every one in his own path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Okay, first of all, we know right now, if a human being falls on the sword, it's going to wound him, right? It's going to wound him. These things fall on the sword, and they're not wounded. They are not wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. Sure sounds like an infestation. They shall enter at the windows like a thief. That sounds like an infestation. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw the shining. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great. He has strongly executed his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can abide? Amen. Let's keep reading. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me all with, with all your heart, with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. And when your heart, not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And it repenteth him of evil. Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him? Even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet of Zion and sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck breast. Let the bridegroom go forth out of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. reproach. That the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore, should they say among the people, where is their God? Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Let me read that again. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yes, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn, wine, and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make your reproach among the heathen. I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into the land barren and desolate with his face towards the east and his hinder part towards the uttermost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Now, before I continue, don't think you know that that's the army. Let's keep going. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine tree do yield their strength. Be glad, then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down upon you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. The, that's three things. The rain, the former rain, and the latter rain. In the first month, and the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine. And I will restore to you the years of locusts. Listen, verse 25 of Joel chapter 2. I will restore to you the years the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Hmm. Hold up. Let me stop right there. Listen. I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Now, in that was uh, actually verse 25. And in verse 11, he says, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. What army? Those things that were just dressed up like mighty men. I'm not going to attempt to figure this out. But the Lord said, locust, the canker worm, and the caterpillar. Because, see, I often wondered in Revelation chapter 9 why he would have to command an army of men not to, not to hurt the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree. But locusts are hungry for green stuff, right? And the canker worm, certainly. And the palm worm, certainly. I'm not a locust or a canker worm, 
or pommel worm or stink bug or anything else. But th- the Lord said this was his army. And you know what? I noticed something. I know this sounds outlandish to a lot of people because of things they've learned. But listen, I've noticed that God uses the natural things of the earth to confound everything men thought they knew. Does he not use the foolish things of this world to confound the wise? Does he not? We have donkeys talking in the Bible. Any other way the Lord could have got somebody's attention, but he did it through a donkey. He sent plagues and bugs in Egypt. Lice, things of that nature, did he not? Did he not? He, he confounds the wise of the world with these simple and foolish things they say are foolish. Anyway, the only difference is these things hurt. And you know what? I, you know what there is? There is actually a species of ancient locust that has venom in the tail. Did you guys know this? Venom is in the tail. But this somehow reminds me of something else. I, you know, I'm not going to come to any. Right now, I have to trust what the Word of God says. That the locust, the canker worm, and the palmer worm are his great army in this this uh, thing. Because it did say that they're going to run upon the houses and come to the windows as a thief. You know, bugs do that. They enter your house, don't they? A plague of bugs would be terrible. That would be terrible. They fly, and their wings sound like cherries. Has anybody ever heard a flight or a group of locusts, what they sound like? They sound like wind, trains helicopters and everything else all at once. Have you guys, you've heard that, Paula? I mean, it is ridiculously loud when these things fly over in mass like that. Anyway, we're just reading the Word of God for the Word of God. Letting the Word of God tell us what the Word of God says. Does that confuse anybody? I think I confused myself on that one. What we're saying is that we're not trying to interpret anything. We're just reading it as it is. We're we're not throwing anything extra in there. I mean, this is something the Lord wrote. His army, the locust, the palmer worm, and the canker worm. Nobody interpreted that. That was written before. That was written. So, it's just not a good day. Now, listen. Listen. Let's keep reading. The six angel sounds. This is the second woe. The six angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which was before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day and a month and a year for to slay a third part of men. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of horses were as the heads of lions. All right, let's read that again. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Okay, the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Now the mouths issued fire, smoke, and brimstone. Can I stop real quick? If Paul had this dream, right? Paul had this dream. Yeah, let's just say he saw a tank. You know how they paint the little lion's teeth on the front of a tank and you got the driver poked out of the hole? I'm just saying. How would what context could he use in that respect? How would he explain this? I mean, if we saw something in the future, the only thing we could liken it to are those things that exist in our environment right now. Because we'd have no context to explain it. Right? We'd have no context to explain it. So we don't know what, if you put yourself in John's shoes and listen to his description. Thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire, and of jacinth and brimstone. And the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions. Out of their mouths it used smoke and brimstone, uh, fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three was a third part of men killed by fire, by smoke, and by brimstone, which issue out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails.
for their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. Now, if you saw, if you saw a, a vehicle of some sort today, one of the vehicles of today, if he saw it, and you know how we paint things on our vehicles with teeth on the front, with a turret hanging out the front to shoot shells, that looks like fire broken fire smoke and brimstone and then we have a tail gunner on the back how in the world could someone describe that you couldn't describe that couldn't describe it you'd have no context to describe that at all none zero zilch no context i'm just saying now this is i'm not interpreting anything i'm just saying he there's no way he'd be able to describe that he'd have no context and so everything that's mobile would be a chariot or a horse. Let's continue. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and had heads, and with them they do hurt. And the rest of the men, this is important. The rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. The key term here is, and the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues repented not of the works of their hands. What kind of people are those if they don't repent of the works of their hands? It said these this 200 million component whatever it is, killed one-third of mankind. But the men who were not killed from this did not repent. That does not sound like a Christian. Or certainly, it doesn't sound like a uh, humble Christian. Maybe a hard-headed one, not an humble. You see, folks, what I'm getting at, these small things in here that we have to take into account. It, it's also why it's extremely important to read the Word of God but to watch things manifest, to watch them manifest. These folks that were left, two-thirds of men, the rest of it, he said the rest, the rest. They didn't repent. These first things on the first woe, these locust things, they could not hurt any of the 44,000. Why? Because they had the seal of God on the forehead. In verse 4, they were commanded not to hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which had not the seal of God in their foreheads. So they were not allowed to touch the 144,000. If they were not allowed to touch the 144,000, then at this time the 144,000 are where? On earth. Let's take a break. That was pretty good. The coffee, that is. I'm drinking coffee. That's pretty good. We're going to take a break, and I'll be right back. We have crammed in quite a bit of information tonight. It's good to study. It's good to study. It really is good to study. And you know what? I believe in one thing, though, really. I believe in reading an entire book through and then allowing God to get the revelation to the body because it will certainly begin to take place. It will certainly begin to take place. And when it takes place, we have to be prepared, just like the weather. I think I started talking about the weather a long time ago. Long time ago, started talking about the weather. And you know what? But here's the problem. Even though you know a fact, it's very difficult to communicate the fact because you speak against what's normal. And when you speak against what's normal, it's very hard to swallow. It's uncomfortable to swallow. You don't trust it from the onset. You really don't. I'm just telling you the truth. When you hear a fact from somebody, you have to know where the person is coming from. And a great many people, they have no clue of who I am. I have no history with them like I do with you. So they're going to be skeptical. But when the facts come true, sometimes you want to beat yourself up for not listening. But don't do that either. Do not do that. Don't do it. Don't do it to yourself. I suggest this. In the book of Proverbs, it says a wise man is slow to speak but quick to listen. We should be like that. 
You see, wise people won't throw a rebuttal out for everything somebody says. They hear things. They pray about things. They're given pearls. They're given pearls. If you are given a pearl, keep it close. Then it will come. You'll see. You'll be able to prove. You know, the Bible, the Lord said, well, not the Lord, but the Bible said, test all things. All things must be tested. If you have a dream or something that does not come to pass, then you be, you have to begin to understand the nature of your dreams. If somebody says something that does not come to pass, well, uh, places a person on the suspect list, but understand the nature of his conversation. That's why I don't, need, I don't trust things that I hear either. I trust the word of God just as it's written. I really do. If the Lord says, then after that this happens, then after that this happens, that's exactly what I believe. And then it comes to pass, and I'm like, huh, I'm so glad I believed in the word. I do not take a formula and apply it to the Bible and do like a lot of people did. They said, well, the, the rapture is coming on this date because the Bible says in this verse and you subtract this from this and add this and then you have this over here with the square root of this. No, I don't do any of that stuff. I don't do that. And you can't read one book in the Bible and expect to know it all. Because even the book of Revelation has support books in the past. It automatically told me I had to study the old prophecies to understand Revelation. I did. But I can assure you of this. One day, all of us will know. That's why I never entertain arguments about what's going to happen first in this lesson. If I'm secure in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I am really giving it 100%, then if I miss a detail in Revelation, right? Or if I fail to, uh, if I fail to remember something, it's not going to hurt me. First of all, I'm prepared to go the entire distance. I'm not attempting to get out of anything early. One reason is that my brothers and sisters are still out there suffering. And I will not leave them on the battlefield, not by my own. When you do love the Lord, you love your brothers and sisters. Who shut the door on the ark? Anybody know? Who shut the door on the ark? Even in the parable about the five wise and five foolish virgins, who shut the door? You see, because Noah would not have shut the door. He would have said, come on, God shut the door. He shut the door. Just like those of us who are working and laboring, we may not know when the Lord takes us up because we're going to be working. We're not going to be focused on the Lord taking us up. We're going to be focused on the work. Noah obeyed God. Noah took his family in the ark. God shut the door, not Noah. In the parable about the five foolish and five wise, the virgins did not shut the door. The door was shut. If I'm laboring in the field, and that's where my focus and concentration is, obeying the word of God. I'm going to be doing his will when he comes back. You know, I thought I read a scripture somewhere where he was talking about coming back and seeing servants not working, but playing in the world. You know, that is, Jesus said that himself. If he comes back and you're not doing the work of the Lord, then you're doing the work of the world. And if you're doing the work of the world, you said in your heart, my Lord, delay his coming. So I'm going to go back and toil in the world. And if you're doing that, that servant, that to that servant, he'll come back as a thief, and they're going to go where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He already said the harvest is ready, but the laborers are few. 
I choose to do his will and work. I'm not going to be focused on uh, a pre-trib, uh, up-trib, down-trib, the trib I thought a trib, trib didn't come into any of those trips. I'm focused on the will of God. I never try to get out of anything. The word says, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. So we can't get caught up on details either. Of all the books in the Bible that we most hold closely to our hearts are in the words of Jesus, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It does not concern me how long Noah's fingernails were. It doesn't concern me what color wormwood is. It does, certainly doesn't concern me if the trumpets are gold or made out of stone. That doesn't concern me. We know the locusts are coming out of the earth. But we don't know what they are. They could be a mutated, mutated looking bug that nobody has ever seen. But guess what? We know who's on the earth at that time. We know the 144,000 are there. And we know that the other things killed one third of men and two thirds of the men did not repent of the works of their hands, which gave an account of everybody on earth, don't we? We don't know. You know what? We don't know everything about the earth. That's why we have to read the Word of God, not changing anything in the Word of God. If God says, and then after this, and then after that, I believe in his order. That would be like taking Genesis and saying, well, no, God created the moon before he created the sun. Now, who's going to argue about that? Who would do that? But see, a great many people don't know that there are mutations under the earth that are dormant. They can't conceive of what's laying under what they call the third layer of earth. There, there's no way they can conceive of it unless they have firsthand knowledge. But I guarantee you people are going to find out fairly quickly what that is. Then they'll understand the devastations that will be released on earth. I told you guys before, there are huge insects left in the earth, but they're dormant. Their larvae are dormant. In the earth. Anyway, not going to get on that subject, but I'm just saying people can predetermine what they believe. I choose not to do that. I choose to read the word of God, not let God reveal it in his timing. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is something we can have now. We can have that now. We can perform in that now. We can live by that prescribed way of life now, not later. Therefore, I don't get caught up on interpretations of things right now, because surely the entire body will know. The Lord's not going to have us ignorant concerning these things. They will be declared. We'll see them. Some of us won't see all of them. Some of us will, and there are different vessels made for different things. I may be a vessel that will go through the whole thing. Somebody else may be a vessel that won't see a thing. Their life could be over next week. Their life could be done in a few hours. And if that's the case, that person won't see anything. They finished their race. We didn't. See, we can't go anywhere until the Lord says, okay, it's your time. You're not going anywhere until the Lord says you're going somewhere. So if somebody does go somewhere... That was the Lord's will when that person resides in Christ. If he does not reside in Christ, well, then things are, things are, your, your, your mercy and grace is lifted from you. You have a reprobate mind. You're given chance after chance after chance, but, uh, yeah, it's up to you. So folks are going to take, we have studied that. I'm going to come back one more time. I have to address something. So I'll be right back. Just one more time, one more break. 